Philanthropy comes from two Greek words and it means the love of humankind. I think Roy's an enormously generous man and it's not just about money and I think philanthropy is not just about money. The figures are somewhere between 50 and 100 million and probably up towards the top end of that range. You have enriched the lives of so many people in New Zealand. You've cared for them. You're interested in what they're doing. Well done. One of the quotes of Winston Churchill in the Mackenzie Room is a good one. We make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. At a country estate near Christchurch, New Zealand, Roy Mackenzie is going back to school. These days, it's a special boarding school where troubled kids get help and direction. Seventy years ago, it was his home. This was the uh, old open veranda, open to the sun, uh, and it's now the principal's office. And from there, this room was our visitor's lounge, and it had a lovely view of a large rose garden that we boys had to mow the lawn around. That was quite a job. Not much of the old place left, but this is the uh, Old original fireplace, uh, one of the few things that's uh, still here. We did have a piano in this corner, and that was about it. In a remarkable act of generosity, the former Mackenzie home and country estate was donated to the government and became the Mackenzie Residential School. It was a wonderful place to start with. We had a, a tennis court and about a hundred acres really, so it was sort of light farming, a mixture of everything really, and uh, age uh, of six and eight my brother was. It couldn't have been a better place for us to grow up in. And we used to play out there, it was all lawn, uh, and it wasn't until 1996 that we decided this was a good spot for the rose garden. Yeah. Father died in 1955 and mother a year later, so we rented the place for a while and then friends were in it for a while and then when they moved into town we thought well this is too good a site not to be used for anything but something like a residential school and we had about six or twelve months negotiating before that happened and fortunately that happened uh, around the middle 60s. They're the sort of kids who are aggressive, uh, often abusive, uh, kids who are just not prepared to accept the, uh, the normal constraints that uh, school places on pupils. There's frequently difficulties in their home situations too and they're becoming a, uh, a menace sometimes in their home community. So they're the sort of kids for whom uh, the prospects are really quite bleak. This is Giving your home to the government when you don't need it anymore is a rather unusual thing to do. Roy McKenzie did just that. In fact, he spent most of his life giving things away. Things like his property, his money, his energy, and his time. Roy's father did it too. And in doing so, the McKenzie family have turned the success of their former retail empire into a powerful 
an enduring legacy that changes the lives of struggling New Zealanders, like the boys here. There would be no pupils leave here unchanged. We see dramatic changes in many pupils. Uh, they move successfully back into regular schools and that is especially so where they have uh, good support from their families and in the wider community and the schools are, themselves are open to uh, receiving them back into working through the transition and helping pupils settle back into to regular life after the time they've had with us. Yes, I had the plaque made of mother and uh, thought it was a nice memorial for her. While it's not in the ideal situation here, it's at the entrance and it's created quite a bit of interest. Lady May Mackenzie was Roy's mother. She married John Robert Mackenzie in 1918. J.R., as he became known, was 42 at the time and had immigrated from Australia. He'd served in the Boer War with Victoria Bushman's Regiment, a group of hard cavalrymen, each of whom had brought their own horse to South Africa. When he got back home, John and his sister Ella set up a fancy goods shop next to their Melbourne residence. Home and shop later burned down, John saving his sister in dramatic fashion. In 1909, he took a break for a motorcycle tour of New Zealand. That gave him the first of many good ideas. Dunedin, 1910, was an exciting place to be. Up at Forbury Park, Lord Kitchener had arrived to wave the flag in the farthest outpost of the Empire. Down in the Octagon and Princes Street, the city's heart was throbbing. Pedestrians, trams, horses, all hustled to and fro as they went about their business. John Mackenzie saw business in Dunedin too, new business. He decided to stay in New Zealand and open the first Mackenzie's store. It did a booming trade in fancy goods. And before long, he opened another, and another, then another. 50 years later, his sister Ella told a staff celebration how hard they worked in those early days. I might tell you we opened our shop at 9 a.m. in the morning and we closed it at 10 p.m. every weeknight. But on Saturday we opened at 9 and we closed at 11 p.m. <laughs> but then we had opposition every night when we get home at that awful hour. He'd say, how much did you take? And we had to count, and believe me, I won nearly every time. <laughs> Mackenzie soon became a household name in New Zealand. Every town of any size had a Mackenzie store, usually right across the street from their great competitor, Woolworths. Every store was an Aladdin's cave of low-cost merchandise, the air filled with the aroma of soaps, perfumes, and powders. When May Mackenzie produced two sons, Don and Roy, J.R. had another bright marketing idea. He combined their names to brand the company's flagship line of underwear, Royden. For generations of Kiwi kids, Roy and Don Mackenzie became, literally, the name on everyone's bottom. Even through the gloom of the 1930s depression, Mackenzie's stores were always bright and bustling. J.R. ran the business in a firm, hands-on manner. He had an astute eye for a bargain and didn't tolerate fools gladly, but he took a genuine and generous interest in his staff. A job at Mackenzie's was a job for life, and his employees were proud to be a part of it. When the 25th Jubilee was celebrated with a grand ball in 1935, every staff member in the country signed an ornate letter of thanks to their boss and benefactor, J.R. Mackenzie. They wrote effusively. The happy and contented staff are a tribute to the personal interest you have shown at all times in the welfare of your employees. And the staff deeply appreciate the many generosities you have shown 
and the interest you have taken in the varied social and sporting activities. Yours respectfully, the staff. His Mackenzie empire made JR a wealthy man, but he saw how many New Zealanders had to struggle, especially through the Depression years, at a time of minimal help from the state. So he put his money to work for others, setting up a youth education fund in 1938. By 1940, war had erupted in Europe. New Zealand prepared to follow the mother country into battle, but still had time to celebrate 100 years as a royal member of the empire. While the nation's centenary celebrations went on, J.R. Mackenzie made a big decision. He put 100,000 pounds of his own money into a new charitable trust and announced that every year, one third of Mackenzie's annual profits would go into it as well. The main objects of the new trust were to help disabled servicemen, the Plunkett Society, and in the quaint language of the time, delicate, ill, ailing, or backward children. 65 years later, the language is different, but the objects are the same. The aim of the trust is to improve the quality of life of New Zealanders who have special needs or who have disadvantages. We do that mainly by making grants to charitable organisations that that provide services for those people. Well, Rangatira is an investment company. It was originally set up by J.R. McKenzie to uh, manage the assets of the trust. Uh, it's been operating since uh, about the 1930s. Uh, and at the moment, we have $100 million in round figures of, uh, of funds to invest. J.R. McKenzie set, set up Rangatira Limited, the investment company, as well as the trust. Rangatira makes the money and we spend it. Hmm. Rangatira was named after the founder, J.R. McKenzie, uh, who was known by his staff in those days, in the early days, as the chief or the rangatira. The amount that we're able to um, pass on now to the community is as great as at any time in the, in the Trust's history. By the end of the war, J.R. was 70 and ready to retire. He went back to the family estate in Canterbury, Royden Lodge, where he continued his lifelong interest in harness racing, importing and breeding many champion horses. Royden Lodge Stud, like Mackenzie's, became another famous name in New Zealand. The blood of champions pumped through the heart of Royden horses as they triumphed in inter-dominion championships, set records in America, and took no less than four Auckland Cups. Son Roy wore the Mackenzie racing colours himself for 33 years, driving his last winner in 1987 with Argentina. Argentina over talent. Argentina from over talent. Just judge will go for a photo. Argentina gets the call after running second here on the first night. The horse is by Game Pride from Chella Rima, owned by Mr. Roy Mackenzie, and driven by Roy Mackenzie. Pays three. The distinctive colours are still seen today. In 1949, J.R. became Sir John, when he received a knighthood for services to philanthropy. A little later, he sat for a portrait by eminent artist Edward Halliday. He had earlier commissioned Halliday to do a portrait of Winston Churchill, whom J.R. greatly admired. That portrait hangs today in Parliament Buildings, Wellington. In 1955, May and John set sail on a trip to England. After falling ill on the way, J.R. Mackenzie died in a London hospital. His trust lives on. Jack Lovelock is still running at the entrance to Timaru Boys High School. As he triumphed at the Berlin Olympic Games in 1936, the two Mackenzie boys arrived at Timaru as boarding pupils. I enjoyed my days at Timaru, but I think it was mainly because of the activities of sport. 
uh, more than anything. I had to work like hell to try and uh, bring my standard of study up, which I think I just managed to do to convince him by getting my matric in the finish. Dennis. Hmm. Junior singles. Mackenzie beat Oxley. Don and I had uh, a reasonable involvement. Uh, we had quite a, quite a few scraps, expect for brothers, but we were in the first 15 together one year. That was good. Uh, this takes me back. Uh, one of the great games we had at rugby was against uh, Faux Waitaki Boys High School. And uh, we were down 13-3 at half time and we came out and won 17-16. So that, that was, a, uh, was a great day. I was on the wing and uh, of course, the winger's job is to make tries, but I fortunately made the four tries that gave us the victory, and they carried me off on their shoulders. Uh, that was probably the greatest highlight I had in my school years. I came across one little bit here that was quite interesting. It said, Mackenzie made several good breaks and appeared cool. I thought that was rather good. And again, I found... Uh, 1938, as a junior, I won the uh, school tennis senior championship. So, and I won it for the following two years. So, yeah, that was some good stuff here. In the triple jump, it was known then as the hop, step, and jump. Halfway through the event, I wasn't getting anything like the distance I knew I could. I had the cheek to ask them to dig the pit a bit longer. They did that and uh, it seemed to work because the next jump I made, 43 feet, lasted for 40 odd years as a record at the school. The Tesh Maker Cup was an award that became available to the most outstanding old boy. It's been won two or three times by the likes of Lovelock, Dick Taylor, a couple of All Blacks, uh, Lockie Grant, uh, Manchester, and uh, in music it went to Michael Houston. I was fortunate to be awarded it in 1952 as captain of the Olympic ski team at Oslo, and again 1996 uh, for community work when I was awarded the Order of New Zealand. It was obvious that quiet young schoolboy Roy was more than a little gifted, especially at sports. Older brother Don was the more outgoing and aggressive, and seemed the natural heir to the Mackenzie business empire. It didn't work out that way. In 1941, Don joined the Air Force. He wanted to be a fighter pilot, and after initial training at Harewood, went to base Woodburn, near Blenheim, to gain his wings. The class graduated in December and celebrated Christmas while waiting to be posted overseas. On the 21st of January, 1942, Don McKenzie and Jack Villers climbed into their Harvard and took off for some bombing practice at Lake Grasmere, just a few miles south on the Pacific coastline. Neither men nor machine were ever seen again. Extensive searches found nothing except a seat cushion that washed up on the shore a few days later. His devastated father paid for extra searches, but to no avail. The Mackenzie's son and heir, like so many of his classmates, would not grow old. He would be 21 forever. Roy was now the only surviving child of J.R. and May. As soon as he was old enough, and despite the misgivings of his grieving mother, Roy also signed up for the Air Force. 
Before long, he was off to Edmonton, Canada, to train as a Lancaster bomb aimer. They graduated with a memorable banquet at the plush McDonald Hotel. Warsaw Concerto, that, that was a favourite piece during the war. But uh, when we came to our graduation in Edmonton of our bomb aimer group, we were up on the stage in a beautiful uh, hotel and a lovely grand piano out in front. And out of the blue, they suddenly announced I was going to play the Warsaw Concerto. Well, I could have gone through the floor. But somehow, you rise to these occasions and I managed to rip it off reasonably well, I think. I had a lovely card from one of the old uh, members of the Bomb Amers group a few years ago, and he said, I always remember your playing the Warsaw Concerto at, at the ceremony. So I thought it was great, really. From Canada, it was on to England and the Lancaster Bombers of 103 Squadron. Skipper Shem Dowd was a Kiwi, and so were all the crew except for engineer Jock Todd, a canny Scotsman. Jock was the only crew member with any previous operational experience, and that proved a very good thing one dark English night. In fact, there may well have been no life and times of Roy McKenzie uh, had old Jock not saved our lives one dark night uh, over the Lincolnshire walls. The night uh, Jock pretty well saved us, so that's why we're still here today. Uh, we were on a night exercise and we were doing a three-engine landing at night. Unfortunately what happened, there was a bit of a mix-up and we finished up with two engines dead on one side and we started to dip down to the ground. I had great difficulty in holding the wing up and holding my height and it uh, was very essential uh, to get both those right. And the check pilot was getting a bit twitchy and um, I said, you know, we'll Lift your wing up, keep it straight. And I said, well, I'm very much a bear, can't hold the thing. I hadn't been plugged in to the intercom, but uh, the navigator next to me saw what was happening, plugged me in, and the first thing I heard, we've had it, we've had it. So uh, that gave me a bit of a start and woke me up. But fortunately, Jock, who was standing behind the uh, instructor, uh, realised what had happened. And he climbed between the instructor's legs, and pushed the feathering button and got the thing going again. And uh, we picked up our speed before we touched the ground. In fact, uh, Jock told me subsequently that he looked down the wing and he actually saw green grass in the light of the navigation light. So uh, we were close <laughs> that night. So we all jumped out of the plane when we landed and had a bloody good drink. favourite of mine, uh, Glen Orkey, to see Eileen Todd at uh, Glen Royden Lodge. Uh, oh, it's always wonderful to know you're on the road to coming up near Paradise. Paradise is just next door to it and uh, had some wonderful trips with the family uh, coming up here. The environment uh, isn't being looked after anything like uh, as well as it should be. This is unique. You wouldn't see anything better than this anywhere in the world. So we've got to be careful to, to look after the whole area. It, it's such a magnificent place. Look at that view. Jock and Eileen ran the Arthur's Point Hotel for a number of years and then Eileen felt she should start up in Glen Orkey and we bought a cafe that we extended uh, and then added the accommodation Glen Royden Lodge and that's been going now for about uh, six or seven years and it's proved very popular. 
The Arthur's Pointer Tale was certainly a lot of fun. We met wonderful people, uh, skiers. Uh, Roy brought a lot of his friends to visit us and uh, you know, we, we met wonderful people, very good skiers from Europe and all over the place, and uh, thoroughly enjoyed uh, our stay at Arthur's Point. We were there for nine years, and we, we, we had a record while we were there. We, we sold a hot rum punch, and the best year we had, we sold um, 75 gallons of rum in 12 weeks and uh, I made 450 <laughs> gallons of punch to put in it. And, uh, so it was quite a record, apparently, for rum seals. <laughs> it was good. Glenorchy is very, very special. It attracts very special type of people, people who love the outdoors and really appreciate what the scenery and what's here. We've been involved with good film crews, mountain climbers, judges, all sorts of people who come and tramp. And we've had some wonderful guests that stayed with us. Shirley was two of the finest people I think I've ever met in my life. Because when I first met Roy, we arrived in Wellington on our way to Queenstown with a car loaded with five kids, and they were on 14 to four months old. And uh, Roy said, when you get to Wellington, give me a ring. I've organized you some accommodation. So I arrived in Wellington, very hot day, thinking I was going to a motel with the five children. But instead of that, Roy met us and said, Right boys, the two older boys jump in my car, I'm taking you home. So we followed Roy out to his home and uh, Shirley was there and greeted us, made us so welcome. I couldn't believe that anyone could greet five young children and the people they didn't know. And she looked after us and she made us very, very welcome. And it was really fantastic. I've never forgotten it, never. <laughs> friend and I, Paul and I, have been friends right from school days and we had fatted together, worked at odd jobs, make more money. But in the end I said to Paul, look, if we don't go next year, we'll never go. They said, right, we'll make it 1948. <laughs> so we had to rush down uh, and find a boat that was going about the same time, which happened to be the Port Hobart. So away we went in April 1948. I think we had dinner that night and that was the last time I ate for three days. <laughs> and, uh, but they don't let you stay or like that for long. They get you up and walk you around and all the rest of it. And everybody, including Roy, looking like a lot of sick ducks sitting out on the deck. So we all met, you know, just casually having meals, playing games there, quoits and table tennis, one thing or another. Roy was up in first class, we were all down in the steerage, and he had to come down if he wanted to meet anybody, which he did. The Port Hobart trip to England in 1948, yeah, it was a wonderful trip. It was the first experience of that kind, really, with friends and friendships, uh, and thank goodness, uh, that was where I met Shirley and uh, that made all the difference. The 48 Olympic team were on board and having the movie camera there I was able to take some quite unique shots because that was the last time an Olympic team went to the Games uh, by ship. I've enjoyed making films. I'd made a few films before that, but nothing very great, and that led to further development, which I really have enjoyed.
wonderful because it was the first holiday we'd had. We were free, you know, we were off. It was fun, really fun. In fact, we were very sorry to arrive in England. <laughs> England in 1948 was a whole lot different from Roy's first visit four years earlier. His job was a lot different too. He was there to gain experience with English retailing giant Marks and Spencer. In between assignments, he had time to film some of the Olympic Games at Wembley, catching up with his recent shipmates when the New Zealand team marched in. When the real competition started, hurdler Dutch Holland found his one hurdle shipboard training hadn't been much help. After the Olympics, Roy enjoyed exploring the English countryside, especially if that was a chance to take Shirley out, and he kept fit with a little rock climbing. He had a bigger rock in his sights, the mighty Matterhorn. The Matterhorn is not one of the world's highest peaks, but it is one of the most dramatic. The little Swiss village that leads to it, Zermatt, is a very picturesque place, but in the local cemetery lie some of the 500 people who have died on the Matterhorn since it was first climbed in 1865. Roy arrived in Zermatt, booked his guide, and they had a little practice. Three days later, the weather looked good for a 3 a.m. start. By sunrise, they had reached 13,000 feet, higher than Mount Cook. Roy was hauling his 16mm movie camera up as well, and as the route got steeper, the camera got heavier. The climb turned from rock to snow and ice. Crampons were fitted. Then, miraculously, it seemed, they were there, 15,000 feet above Europe. There was only one way for a young Kiwi to describe that feeling. Bloody marvelous. Roy described that day on the Matterhorn as the most memorable of his life, but he had another one coming up soon. I thought, oh, well, you know, he's okay, but I didn't think anything much about it. So he started following me everywhere, everywhere I went. Roy turned up. My girlfriend, Paula, accused me of asking him everywhere. I said, I never asked him. But she knows, she realises now, she knows that he does just what he wants to do. Always has. I had met JR before, I had no idea what he was like, and Roy had never ever said a thing about it to me. And I hadn't met his mother, of course, and when we came home we were to meet his parents. We thought it would be better to get married in England, avoid all the fuss, there was only 12 of us at the wedding, <laughs> because we knew what it would be like if we came back here. We've been married 55 years and very happy to have had that long involvement. Uh, I don't know if there's any formula at all, but I know uh, if you make a mistake, it pays to admit it smartly. If you're correct, shut up. All too soon, it was back to New Zealand, settling into married life at Lowry Bay on Wellington Harbour and joining the family firm. 
Roy started as an assistant in the buying department, but like the famous baking powder, the boss's son was sure to rise. Soon he was in head office, planning new McKenzie stores up and down the country. Eventually there were 75 of them, from Kaitaia to Invercargill. But when winter came, there was only one place for Roy to be, out skiing, and usually well up with the leaders. Here he battles the snow and the excellent Lonsdale brothers at the 1950 National Championships on Coronet Peak. My involvement uh, started uh, in 1935 up at uh, the Ball Hut in Mount Cook and uh, finally we went back 1937, a third former, and we won the secondary school skiing competition, uh, the Wiggly Cup. So yeah, it goes back to pre-war and in those days uh, there were no instructors, uh, there was no edges on the skis and uh, your boots were almost nailed to the skis. 1946, I competed in the championship and was disappointed. Uh, in the downhill, I started the small avalanche. I missed a pair of flags in the slalom. And I knew I could do better, so I was determined uh, the following year to make an effort during weekends. And that paid off because the following year, I won the South Island champs, the downhill and the slalom. Just tearing down the mountain on a couple of boards uh, with hardly a care in the world uh, and making some down-to-earth friendships, uh, that's been one of the joys of skiing. Roy's joy and his skill caught the eye of the national selectors. On Christmas Eve 1951, he left by flying boat for Oslo in Norway. He had been selected for New Zealand's first ever Winter Olympics team as captain. Among the mighty skiers of Europe and America, the Kiwi team was there for the experience rather than the hope of seriously competing. But even that modest plan didn't work out for Roy after he crashed in practice. I was disappointed uh, at the Olympic Games. You put such an effort into training and to at the last minute be practicing the downhill, having a prang and breaking my wrist uh, meant I wasn't able to uh, compete. But on the other hand, uh, out of misfortune often comes fortune. And I was given VIP treatment and because I had my movie camera, I was able to take some fairly good shots of the top skiing races and that was very useful when we came back to New Zealand. Roy's film footage is a unique record of the Oslo Games and our first Winter Olympic team. Back in New Zealand he showed it to ski clubs around the country, raising funds for another Mackenzie bright idea. The Mackenzie Ski Scholarships uh, resulted from the Olympic Games in 52, from the film I was able to take there and show to clubs around the country when I was visiting. That raised enough funds to set it up for a couple of years and that provided uh, six youngsters aged 13 race training for one week in accommodation in the North Island and the same in the South Island and that operated for 25 years. Because I was able to fund it later on, I funded it for that period. And a lot of our champions came from that uh, course. Back to Wellington and back to work. Roy was now an only child and clearly had inherited some of his father's philanthropic tendencies. He joined the Mackenzie Trust, followed JR into Rotary, and played a big part in founding Birthright New Zealand for single parent families. Out at Lowry Bay, his own family was getting bigger rather quickly. Roy and Shirley adopted three children, Peter, John and Robin, who thrived in the seemingly endless golden weather of 50s New Zealand. Oh, 
Well, Larry Bay was certainly a happy childhood. We were fortunate we had a lot of family around us, and so uh, the Bay was uh, a pretty interesting and exciting place to grow up. There was a lot of, uh, a lot of things you could do there. We had the beach and the bush behind us, and uh, we used to have uh, a lot of freedom to uh, get out and really enjoy ourselves. We grew up in Larry Bay. Mum and Dad had bought it before Peter was born, and until I left home, I lived in that same house. We had a lovely big section. Um, with a tennis court and then later on a swimming pool, we were very lucky. We weren't really aware that we were a wealthy family, um, but comments from other people or, uh, you know, made, made us become aware, I think. Um, uh, but we just felt that we lived, we grew up as, as any normal, normal family and, and uh, that was it. I don't think we could have known that we were in a wealthy family because we really had no exposure to anything else to compare it with, I suppose. We went to what effectively was a local school, but was a prep school. There's probably no way we could be any more aware there. I think as a child you tend not to, not to, not to notice those sort of things, unless there's some predicament that you're in where it becomes very clear that, that you um, are different in some way. The skiing trips were great. We were very lucky to have the opportunity to go skiing. We went to Coronet Peak a lot because that was his favourite ground. And um, in his movie making, he used to make us come down the slope several times before he got it right. And we all had to go, Peter first, John, then me. And, and then if it wasn't right, back we had to go up the top <laughs> and down again. But there were other times, I mean, that was fun and, and um, he encouraged us. You know, now I look back and I'm, I'm a good skier now and I'm happy that I'm, good, I'm a good skier. I, you know, I, I thank him for that. I think um, he gave us a marvellous opportunity. I think Dad's enthusiasm for skiing not so much rubbed off as we, we couldn't really avoid it. And, um, and partly because he'd been involved in the construction of the Skyline Ski Club on Whakapapa, then we were there as, as, at the earliest age we could, we could cope with being uh, in, in a place, in an environment like that. There was some footage of our earliest attempts at skiing. Tow ropes rather than T-bars. Tow ropes with a little metal clasp that you attach to the rope each time and you, you have to carry this huge buckle with you when you're skiing. Dad loved his movie making. I can remember him doing this cutting and splicing and joining together and, and uh, it took up a lot of his time but it was a great hobby to have because they, some of them were just so good. We loved to watch us learning to ride bikes and learning to walk and all those sort of things and we, we last year we uh, got him to bring them out yet again and two of our, our, our children and there were, must have been a few other grandchildren there. I was doing the hula hoop as a probably a four year old and, and I was quite good on the hula hoop <laughs> and I can remember our middle daughter Anna she was rolling on the floor. She, was, she just thought it was so funny. And, and that's, that to me has been great because they can see, look back and see what we were like as little Lees. And, and uh, um, you know, I, I really enjoyed that. Tramping is something we've, I started doing, dates back to school days. And after a while, the, the old man started doing a bit. He hadn't done some for quite some time. And he asked us to accompany him on a few trips. He had several planned and uh, we did trips into the um, Nelson Lakes where I spent a lot of time and he started to get a little bit more adventurous and, and uh, get back into uh, a little bit of mountain climbing. We did trips over things like the Copeland Pass and then the uh, Dart Reese walk. Towards the end I was uh, tagging along just to make sure he made it but uh, generally he, uh, he got through them pretty good apart from a couple of instances where he took a bit of a tumble and had to be helped out but, uh, but he was uh, pretty good, he was pretty resilient. I recall the car accident, we were all in the sounds on our summer holiday and Dad had come back earlier and, and on the way home the car had a blowout, hit the edge of the bridge and, and rolled. And so the first thing we heard of it, uh, Mum got the phone call to say he was in the hospital. Well I got all the family together and we all celebrated his return and all the rest of it and he burst into tears, well I've never ever seen that before, but of course he was very weak. And then and gradually it came the time to have this plaster off and they have this little hacksaw buzzing around down each side which makes you sort of cringe a bit. But he recovered out of that, got a bit of a bump on the back of his neck but he, everyone said, oh poor old bugger, he won't ski again. But of course he was in no time. Mm. So those are the risks he takes. He's a very compassionate person. I think he's also very sensitive, although 
he he doesn't reveal that. At least uh, you have to have spent time with him to discover how he shows that. The amount given away over the years is very hard to put a precise figure on. A substantial part's been distributed by the J.R. McKenzie Trust, but there are the other trusts, the Roy McKenzie Foundation, the McKenzie Education Foundation, and of course the uh, what we call the Jacket Pocket Trust, which is the checkbook which comes out um, uh, whenever he comes across a cause he deems worthy, and uh, God knows how much that's come out of that over the years, um, but uh, it must be significant and that's just uh, there's no record of of any of that but um, anecdotal evidence would tend to suggest it's quite uh, quite significant as well then one day on willis street roy bumped into a young austrian architect who had just arrived in new zealand roy figured if he was an austrian he must be a skier so promptly invited him for a weekend at ruapehu it was the start of another lifelong friendship after about my third ski trip, I got back from Ruapayu one day and there was a terribly snow burned. Conditions in Ruapayu were quite different to what they were in Austria, you know. And um, I had blisters, you know, my, my face was peeling and there was a um, uh, bed in, in, in my hotel where I was staying. So Roy came to see me and said, well, this is not good for you. You have to come and stay with us. And this is when I went over to stay with uh, Roy and Shirley. And I think I must have stayed there for at least six months to start off it. <laughs> it was a wonderful stay. And... In 1951, a group of us felt we should build a lodge where we could take our children. So uh, we started off working parties, uh, and for three years uh, we finally uh, finished up with this uh, lovely lodge. Building the Skyland was um, a lot of pleasure, really. It was hard work, but you made a lot of friends, and um, I think uh, it was a wonderful time, really. I mean, we, we uh, worked out there in all kinds of weather, and you know, got soaking wet and freezing cold, and carried all the materials up those days. I mean, there were no helicopters um, to carry um, materials up onto the site. It was good. Extra great part of uh, the hut. I think it's been a very nice, um, uh, ski hut for, for many, many people and um, lots of children had a wonderful time here and they've grown up and their children are staying in the hut now so it is quite rewarding. Lifelong friendships, uh, that's really been part of it and the working parties was as much fun if not more than, uh, than the skiing. There were so many interesting incidents that went on uh, so it, it was a lot of humorous fun. It was no fun at all, though, one Saturday in 53. Once again, Roy McKenzie left his mark in a way he would rather forget. I was showing my friend Gerhardt from Austria the mountain, and we were taking the high traverse across to the Yankee Slalom, and I suddenly hit bottle ice, real bottle ice, and I turned to warn him and the very fact I did that unedged my skis and I was looking down an almost 300 foot vertical drop with two lots of rocks. The first lot I hit, I put my hands over my face and broke fingers, teeth and skin in the face, broke an ankle. The next lot I managed to just get my skis under me when I hit the low rocks. That broke uh, an ankle and I finished up rolling out uh, fortunately still in snow at the bottom. This is where he fell. He slid all the way down past these rocks and that's where he landed up down here. When I skied down to him, he looked a hell of a mess. His uh, glove was off, his finger was 
more or less in half, uh, cut in half, the bone was sticking out, his lips were split, and one of the first things he said to me was, how are my skis? But I was still conscious, and fortunately people came around pretty quickly, and I got whipped off to hospital. Yeah. Well, they named it Mackenzie's mistake, <laughs> just one of the many. Fifty years later, Roy and Gerhard are still going to the skyline and still skiing Ropehu. I first met Karen uh, when she was presented with uh, our Rotary Club Award and she sang for us that day at luncheon and uh, I was so thrilled uh, afterwards I asked her if she'd come and sing at my farewell from the Mackenzie Trust and that was really wonderful and I've kept in close contact and uh, hope to you know, continue to support her. Since I met Roy 12 years ago, he has been extremely supportive in a number of ways of uh, both my singing career and other personal endeavours. And I'm very, very grateful to have him in my life and to have his friendship and support. 18 months ago, I assisted her to go to New York for further voice training to a special voice trainer. She's now going back there for further complete training of that kind for another six weeks and then I'm sure she'll be on the road to success. I do have some Irish and some Maori and some Italian in me, all of which, of course, are cultures that value music. And I feel a special affinity with music from those cultures as well. David is deaf and he uses sign language so at home the language that we use between us of course is sign language, it's the only language we can all understand and we've got three hearing children, three sons, 
the youngest is just a baby, but he's already starting to learn sign language like the older boys just by watching it. And so Roy and Harry sign to their dad and speak to me, or sometimes we mix and do a bit of both. But it's a bilingual household. Mum? Roy has supported my work with deaf people through keeping up contact with me. And when I was in the very early stages of my career, he gave me some funding to go to the States and do some professional development study so that I could then bring back more expertise to New Zealand. And since then, he's kept in close touch with me and my work and through that, what's been happening in the deaf community and keeping an eye on what sort of projects and needs he could help to support. When I went to America, I went to study at a university which had a very big deaf studies department. And one of my lecturers there was a deaf man who was very charismatic and interesting to me. And we ended up marrying, coming back to New Zealand. And by the time our first child came along, Sir Roy was a very special part of our lives together. And so we made the decision to call our first son after Roy. Well, have you got any new homework or what are you going to do? Uh, tonight I have to do um, like Thursday reflection, like right. I can sign good because like I've been learning for a long time and I just picked it up really like I didn't get taught or anything and it's not hard like so if I'm talking to my dad and then my mum wants to know then I can or you know like if I'm talking to my mum and my dad wants to know then I can sign and talk so they'll you know both know at the same time. Roy's been incredibly generous and always willing to take risks on new ventures, take a punt on things and so he's made a tremendous contribution to helping with really new initiatives and new ventures that have been of great help to the deaf community like interpreters, like my training, um, sending deaf people away for training and further education overseas. So he's, he's had a tremendous investment in supporting deaf people very quietly from behind to empower themselves. Roy's support for the deaf mirrored his support for many other causes dear to his heart. He bought land in the Marlborough Sounds and donated it for a new outward bound school at Anakiwa. He helped pioneer music therapy as an innovative therapy for severely disabled children. He promoted children's learning through Capital Discovery Place and he funded the Environmental Education Centre in Wellington's Botanic Gardens. But as New Zealand faced economic realities, Community needs were growing, attitudes were changing too, and Roy saw that the exclusively male trust board was not keeping up with them. Once in the chair, he was quick to make changes. Well, I got a call from Sir Roy, so I went along innocently to a morning tea just to meet some other Outward Bound people. And when I got there, they said that, that was, uh, I'd got, they'd got me there under false pretenses, and they wanted me to become a uh, trustee of the J.R. McKenzie Trust. Roy's comments were at the time, we know what you think about women's issues and we thought we would invite you to be one of the first women. The JR Trust, of course, hadn't had a woman trustee. So it was a new ball game and uh, we had a lot of fun. From there on, uh, the homework was done a lot more carefully just to counteract uh, the statements and proposals that uh, Diana was able to submit. So it was a lot more fun, I think. The only reason I was able to challenge people was that Sir Roy made it very clear that's what I was there for. Bringing the woman's point of view to those trusts did make, uh, I feel, a tremendous improvement. Uh, so many women are organised in organisations today and uh, their point of view has not been well established and these women were able to make a very strong case for the likes of the women's refuge which we'd always had an interest in but those women's issues became much stronger and were much more uh, supported. What we were trying to do was maybe move the J.R. McKenzie Trust to areas where no one else was funding and that's one of the features of Sir Roy. People would approach him for areas where it was not the, the, the done thing to fund and that was in the area of child abuse, sexual abuse of children, um, women's refuge, as I said, and um, rape crisis. Outward Bound Council, of which I was a member, were a bit slow to run courses for women. But eventually, after about seven or eight years, uh, that was agreed, and it's been very successful. And the women gain as much and do as much as most of the males on the courses. 
The J.R. McKenzie Trust had always used Rotary Clubs as its eyes and ears on the community. Roy wanted to see and hear for himself, so he used his own inheritance to set up a new, more streamlined organization. He called it the Roy McKenzie Foundation. What made the Roy McKenzie Foundation different from probably any other philanthropic trust in New Zealand was first of all that the founder was still alive and actively involved in it, and secondly that his personal vision and the issues that he was concerned about in New Zealand society were on the foundation's agenda. And on my first day of work he handed me a cheque for a million dollars, a pad of paper, a pen and a trust deed and said go and set the foundation up responding to people who came in to talk to him about issues, taking them to the trustees, discussing them with the trustees, and then once we had the support of the trustees working on an issue, which is a very unusual approach to philanthropy. I don't like the word philanthropist. Uh, I think my involvement has been more of a community volunteer, uh, which, which is a, a much greater involvement with community work. Uh, most philanthropists, including my father, made donations but didn't have the time to get involved uh, in the organisations and, and that's what I think I've been able to do and it's helped me very considerably. The first woman in New Zealand who wanted to set up a women's refuge came to see him and apparently they asked him for $1,500 and he said to them, you don't need $1,500, you need $15,000 and here's a cheque. So there was that capacity for that kind of creative, responsive grant making. I want you to listen to the sentence and say it back to me, okay? The sentence is... Hannah's dyspraxic, which means she has a number of difficulties associated with her ability to sequence and organise and so on. Um, and over many years we attempted to get to the bottom of uh, her problems and had no luck. And we came, I think, like many people do, by accident to see Brooke McKenzie. Early intervention really only was even talked about in New Zealand in the probably 60s and 70s and I think Roy McKenzie was one of the first people in New Zealand who understood the significance of it. Now, there were all these children whose early educational needs were being neglected and therefore who weren't able to reach their potential and that was one of the causes that once he'd taken it to his heart then we worked with it. Early intervention and treatment has always been one of the priorities in all my work. It's so important and so vital, and it's a bargain compared with the cost of failure. Take the Mackenzie Residential School or the Mackenzie Centre in Hamilton for naught to five year olds, and uh, as well as that, there's the Seabrook Mackenzie Centre for those with learning difficulties. All those uh, projects that the government should be supporting much more strongly. In some cases, they've given no help to those organisations at all. It's a tragedy that, that, that the, a place such as this, where such profound needs are being met, where they can no, be met nowhere else, um, have to rely on the philanthropy and, uh, of Sir Roy. And that derives from his understanding. He understands the problem, and he has the means and the wherewithal and the generosity to deal with it. It was a complete shock when we found that we did have a child with a disability. We first came across the Mackenzie Centre. We actually went there when Catherine was six weeks old. Been going there every week for the first two years of her life. Catherine, the chicken. Your chicken. We met Sir Roy at the McKenzie Centre. He gave us some wise advice to have Catherine to learn to swim. He said to me, Mary, when Catherine's in the water and her face is in that water, we're all equal. It was certainly the greatest advice we've ever received. Sir Roy is a hero. He's a hero to have put so much money into the McKenzie Centre for early intervention. There's nowhere else for these children to go that have a disability. People with special needs children are always looking to find a better way. He's certainly been an icon in our family. And many people have been richly rewarded. When there seems to be nowhere else to go and there is no hope left, Seabrook McKenzie provides a way forward. And that's what a parent ultimately wants. They want hope. They want to be able to believe they can make a difference for their children and Seabrook enables that to happen. Thank <laughs> you.
My interest in the hospice movement started uh, when a colleague suffering from cancer was getting very poor treatment. And when we were in England, uh, I was able to look at St Christopher's Hospice and was immediately sold on the value of a hospice treatment. Uh, I met up with Marion and Max Cooper and we organised a community meeting which was attended by about 200 people and very quickly we had a committee formed and uh, we were away laughing. Roy has always believed in education and because he recognised that education was so important he did establish an education fund and Te Amanga established the first education programme for palliative care in New Zealand so you know his foresight has been absolutely spot on. <laughs> Yes, and so I think it's very um, safe to say that, that hospice care in New Zealand wouldn't be what it is today without the, that kind of support that Roy has started. It would be one of the highlights of my community involvement. That and Outward Bound, I think, come up tops. Uh, it's been so, so great for uh, starting off that movement and seeing it carried on throughout the country, and it's becoming now quite strong and accepted. The Mackenzie story is a great New Zealand story. It's a story of a modest but inspirational achiever who did things in the way we most admire in this country, with quiet determination, minimal fuss, maximum integrity. Throughout the turbulent second half of the 20th century, the Mackenzie Trusts have given many thousands of disadvantaged New Zealanders a life map, a compass, and a helping hand along the way. The Mackenzie inheritance has become a permanent legacy that will do the same for 21st century New Zealand. It's better to light one candle than curse the darkness. You light your candle where you are, you isolate a factor, an injustice or a need, unite with others that care and do something about it. You live your dream. And if you don't dream, you don't achieve.
Thank you.